I want to thank everyone for joining us for Oceans Update episode number nine. This is indeed our last episode of the year, and we're going to cover a great recap of the most important conversation conservation topics um, of 2023. So thank you to those of you who have joined us for some of our prior episodes, um, and to those of you who might be joining us for the first time, thanks so much uh, for being here today. If you haven't tuned in before, my name is Jessica Jarosh. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at DiVentures. Uh, and I am so glad to have Dr. Alex Brilski with us today and throughout all of Ocean's Update. Dr. Brilski is the founder of Ocean Education International, a consulting firm focusing on environmental education and professional development for the marine tourism industry um, and specializing in the recreational scuba industry. Um, he comes highly regarded and is currently the director of education at ReefSmart uh, and the author of The Complete Diver and Beneath the Blue Planet. Uh, we're so excited to have you with us here today, Alex, and to give us a great recap and look back on what's been happening this year across our oceans and waterways. Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate it very much. Uh, as Jessica indicated, I'm going to do something a little different. If you've logged on before, uh, you probably remember that we've typically done a short segment at the beginning on what we call uh, in the news. And then the main portion of the uh, webinar has been a particular topic. And then we've kind of uh, topped things off with a, a brief uh, travel log uh, highlighting one of the destinations from Dive Ventures. Uh, I thought it was appropriate at the end of the year to kind of do something different. And as was was indicated, look at some of the really significant uh, events and news items that have occurred. And we did, I went back and we did about 26 different stories uh, over the, the over the past year. And I kind of looked at them in terms of priority and combined and whatever. And what, what seemed to, to fold out was what you see there on the screen. Uh, the El Nino and the marine heat waves phenomenon, which was in the news extensively throughout the year. Uh, and then, uh, related to that, of course, is the bleaching event, which has been going on and will continue to go on, not only this through this year, but next, likely. And then uh, the status of one of the most significant issues in the Caribbean, which is the stony coral tissue loss disease uh, phenomenon. And I thought I'd do a quick update uh, on uh, lionfish, but also introduce a couple of other uh, invasive species I would su suspect you haven't even heard of, but unfortunately may be in the in the near future so uh in case you uh, were asleep for the past year uh it's probably no um, surprise to you that the take-home message from 2023 is uh, the ocean's in trouble and it was in, it's in trouble uh specifically because of issues related to the warming ocean and these are just highlights from news items over the past year so let me talk a little bit first about this, this phenomenon of marine heat waves. The ocean has been a, a good friend to us because 90% of the excess heat that's been put in the atmosphere uh, due to anthropogenic uh, uh, global warming has been absorbed into the ocean. And so, in other words, without the ocean, Earth would <laughs> likely be not a very pleasant place to live. And in fact, much of it would be uninhabitable. Uh, so good news for the ocean. However, eventually you have to pay the piper. And the the for reasons we won't get into, but the ocean, the surface ocean, is very much separated from the deeper ocean by a, a permanent thermocline, which makes it very difficult for the ocean to mix. What that means is a lot of this heat is held in the upper portions of the ocean, and it's gotten to a point where it's starting to warm the surface temperatures pretty significantly. This is a, a, a uh, snippet from, whoops, let me go back, from uh, NOAA. Come on. <laughs> and you can see that by color there, the very darkest color is uh, almost 90 degrees. You can see how the, uh, the Gulf Stream, and you'll see in a, in a few seconds here, so here we are. This is just a still image, and you can see the extremely warm water throughout uh, Florida, the Northern Caribbean, etc. 
Uh, this one is a little different. You're seeing on the right, these are actual temperatures. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the departure from the, from the normal. The middle is the actual temperature. And on the left, you have what are known as degree heating weeks. This is a way that we keep track of the heat relative to, to, ocean, to uh, coral bleaching. In other words, uh, a degree heating week is when the ocean is one degree warmer than its summertime mean. And bottom line, we seem to see that if coral reefs are exposed to more than about four degree heating weeks, uh, they start to become stressed. And what it's showing there is the number of degree heating weeks. And unfortunately, if you look at South Florida, the Keys, you see 16 plus. Uh, as I said, four is a warning. So it's hardly surprising that we've had the problem with, the, uh, with bleaching. Uh, initially in the Keys, uh, which is beginning to subside a bit, uh, but is now being reported throughout the Caribbean and will be in the Indo-Pacific. So with regard to this whole heat issue, a couple of things that are worthy of note. Uh, how much heat? And this, this is actually incredible. Uh, first of all, most of the half, at least half of the CO2 that humans have put in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution has been in the last 40 years. And there was a paper that came out last year they kind of put that in more uh, kind of understandable terms. And as you see at the bottom, uh, that over that period, it is equivalent to firing off 1.5 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs every second for, the, for that 32-year period. So that's the enormous amount of heat that's been in the upper ocean uh, for uh, accumulating for the past 30 years. And uh, we're now beginning to you know, pay the price. So what this leads us to is that not only have these anomalous heat waves been occurring, but we are also in an El Nino year. And I wanted to explain that a bit because there's a lot of either lack of knowledge or misconception. First of all, the phenomenon that we refer to as El Nino is actually part of a atmosphere ocean coupling called ENSO, meaning it's the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Now, the Southern Oscillation is a meteorological phenomenon, if I can get my uh, cursor over here. Uh, essentially, if all things are normal, the trade winds blow the Pacific Ocean westward, and they build up what is known as the West Pacific Warm Pool. And in fact, the sea level in the Western Pacific is about a meter higher than on the east. Uh, and all of that uh, the tropical weather creates this semi-permanent low pressure zone. This is where all the you know, tropical rain, storms, et cetera, occur. Uh, on the other side of the, of the Pacific, on, the, on South America, it's relatively stable. There's a high pressure system. But you'll notice that by pushing all that surface water over, you're pushing down the deeper cold ocean. And this thermocline which becomes very deep in the west, is actually very shallow in the east, allowing for upwelling to occur and creating one of the most ex extensive uh, fisheries in the entire world on, on the South American coast. Uh, that's the way Mother Nature intended things, and most of the year that's what happens. However, once in a while, normally on a decadal period, this kind of changed. And as the trade winds diminish, this low pressure system moves eastward. And because you have diminished and sometimes uh, the trade winds actually stop, all of this western warm pool flows eastward, drops the thermocline, makes it very difficult for any upwelling to occur. The fisheries crash during this period. And essentially, it upsets the entire uh, weather system pretty much around the world. And so that's kind of the phenomenon. And this video here is going to show you, uh, keep an eye out on the, uh, this, the little rectangle. And we're going to start in, in uh, 1984, which is the first well-documented El Nino. 
And you'll see the, the blue cool water, blue, blue, cool, well, bingo, 87. You see that's El Nino, that red you see in, in there. And things are cooking along. There's another one. Looks like in 80, 94, there was a big one. 97, you're going to see come up pretty quickly here. This one caused the demise of about 15% right there that about 50 percent of all coral reefs on earth uh bleached and died and so that blob of warm water is really what we talk about when referring to el nino and you can kind of see it's a interaction between the atmosphere uh, and as i said we are in the midst of a very significant el nino event and in combination with the problems with the uh the warm water masses we've we've had significant coral bleaching i'll bring to your attention this uh this map it's interactive you can link to it here and and by the way remember all of the links you see in the webinar uh you can download a list and and go directly to the source but you can go in and actually in close and go into each of these locations but just a, a snapshot of what has been happening uh, with regard to bleaching at the time, at least I took this screenshot uh, last week. Uh, if you were with us last uh, time, uh, you saw this, so I apologize if it's a repeat, but I just wanted to review what's happening with this bleaching phenomenon. Bleaching corals, of course, well, but corals can bleach for various reasons, but mass bleaching is, heat induced uh, light has something to do with it as well and when these enormously warm temperatures hit the florida keys uh it was not surprising that uh, the the reefs began to bleach this video kind of shows the details we're we're zooming in on one of the little coral polyps in the tentacle and within the tentacles, the algae, the zooxanthellae reside, and they do their job, photosynthesizing, creating food, sugars for the coral. Uh, they live in the gastrodermis, and the crux of the problem occurs in these stycoloid uh, membranes in the chloroplasts, if you remember high school biology. And what happens is they do their job in spades. Basically, they just pump out more and more uh, food. But in addition, they're also creating lots of oxygen radicals. Uh, they're highly destructive. And in response, the coral gets rid of these algal cells that have, in fact, become uh, dangerous. And that process over time, even though there are millions and millions of these tiny little single cell critters, ends up with the phenomenon of bleaching. Now, bleaching in and of itself is not a death sentence. Basically, it's taking the bulk of the food supply away. Uh, and if they could recover the zooks, then the, the reef can uh, survive. But if it can't, of course, it starves to death. It, but importantly, it also becomes much more susceptible to, to disease because this is a very stressful event. To kind of show you the details, this is Chica Rock's which historically has been a relatively uh, resistant, uh, bleaching resistant uh, site in the upper keys. And you can see for yourself uh, just what has happened. Uh, and 91 degrees Fahrenheit was a pretty consistent temperature uh, throughout the keys through much of the summer. As I said, it's begun to cool off and there's, you know, there's some signs of recovery, but there's gonna be, unfortunately, I think substantial mort mortality. Uh, if you have time, uh, one of the video links I sent, there's a wonderful uh, video of basically what is happening now. This uh, this young woman, she works for one of the news agencies that I, escapes me right now, uh, but she uh, did a report uh, just in late, uh, late October, and it's an update of basically where things are. And as I said, there's some signs of hope and recovery, and I'll just uh, defer to that uh, that video.
Uh, so this is all Caribbean oriented. Here are the predictions for the Indo-Pacific for the next four months. And if you look at the colors, you want to pay attention to the, the, dark, the dark and the lighter red. Those are uh, alerts from the bleach watch, uh, which is maintained by NOAA globally uh, through satellite telemetry. And you see level one is bleaching likely, level two is mortality likely. And so right now, the Indo-Pacific is uh, uh, bracing itself for what's likely to be another very, very significant bleaching event uh, region-wide. Uh, fortuitously, I just saw the news uh, 30 minutes ago about the uh, the IPPC uh, COPA, uh, COPA is Congress of Parties 28. This is the 28th meeting of the uh, uh, members, 180 plus members of the uh, uh, that are signatory to the, the IPCC. And uh, some time ago or earlier this year, actually, there was a report that, uh, you know, basically uh, indicated that this 1.5 degrees C uh, is, that's the target that IP, IPCC is trying to maintain. Uh, but even if we keep with that, there's a likelihood that we'll still, leave, we'll still lose the majority of coral reefs uh, by uh, the end of the, of the century. And if it goes to 2, per, 2 degrees C or about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's even worse. Now, the real tragic story is that we're currently on course for four degrees. Uh, hopefully, that's not going to occur because Earth is not going to be a very pleasant place to be uh, by the end of this century. And there was some hope uh, just announced hours ago. Uh, good news, bad news. It was hoped that the, the consensus statement from the 180 plus countries would finally call for the phasing out of all fossil fuels. There was a lot of debate, uh, uh, and eventually the, cons the consensus uh, statement now says transition away. Uh, this was uh, essentially uh, because of resistance from a lot of the OPEC countries, to be perfectly honest. And uh, it was actually uh, opposed by uh, the US, the EU, and particularly the small island nations who basically have the most to lose because they're going to disappear, uh, <laughs> period, uh, if things don't change. Based on this, 30, 20 plus years ago, uh, I, incur I, I taught my, I, have, I don't have kids, but I have two nephews I'm very close to. And about 25 years ago, I each when each of them uh, became uh, eligible for scuba certification at ten, I I taught them diving and I and I told their dad I'm doing this because th there is a strong possibility that they will not see coral reefs based upon this data that I'm giving you, and I don't know I just thought I would give a perspective that but my oldest nephew uh, just turned I think thirty two, and it brought up something. In case you're unaware, uh, you hear a lot about generations, et cetera, Gen Z, the millennials, et cetera. Uh, the next generation has actually been called Gen Alpha. And these are kids that have born since 2013. What that means is this generation of Gen Alpha the first cohort has just become old enough to get certified. And that has really brought to me, to mind, a very personal issue. My oldest nephew had his first child. This is my grand niece, Maggie. And the question is, will Gen Alpha outlive the Earth's coral reefs? And unfortunately, even with the semi new good news of the uh, COPA at 28. That's true. That, that is likely to be the case that the, the, the generation currently uh, will probably see a world without coral reefs unless we make some pretty significant alterations in what we're doing.
I'll have a little bit of hope at the end, but you know, it's kind of depressing when you, uh, when you think about the reality. Now, the other issue that's kind of, uh, you know, the double edge sword for the, uh, or the double edge, uh, the double whammy rather for the coral reef community is that not only is there a bleaching problem, but there's also the issue with disease. As I mentioned, coral reefs are, that bleach are very susceptible to disease. And the one in particular that arose beginning in 2014 here in Florida and spread see from this uh, map throughout the Caribbean has been termed stony coral tissue loss disease, skittled, some people call it. Uh, by the way, this uh, map you can link and move in to uh, focus in closely to uh, specific locations and it will show you where skittled has been uh, been found. Uh, we haven't yet figured out what skittled is. It does respond to antibiotics. Uh, they use a uh, amoxicillin paste to treat it, which means it's probably uh, bacterial. But there is also uh, a growing consensus that it may start off with a, a viral infection of the of the zoaks. Uh, we. You know, we're, we're working on this. Finally, money has been put into its study, but uh, the jury's still out in terms of uh, what can be done about it. Now, coral disease is not new. Coral diseases have been around since the late 60s, certainly by the mid 70s. But what's really different with Skittled is its virulence. Here's an example. In, in most cases, previous coral diseases would eventually uh, go into stasis. They would eventually stop in, you know, the part of the, the of the coral colony that was alive would continue to live. But uh, skittle tends to be very virulent. And you can kind of see the progression in just six months. As I said, it does respond to treatment. But the problem is the treatment has to be pretty continual because this is a waterborne pathogen, we believe, and therefore, there's a lot of monitoring required. As I said, this started out in what they thought was a disease unique to Florida, beginning in the uh, first scene in the Miami region. And over the course of the year, it, it has now infected the entire reef track from Martin County in the north through the dry Tortugas. Uh, around 19, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, around 2018, it began to pop up in the Caribbean. Since then, this is the uh, disease progression uh, in Grand Cayman. In other words, it's been reported in Grand Cayman throughout its entire reef track. Uh, Cozumel, a little different. Uh, they're with, uh, they have seen it at specific sites, and they've taken an approach where they are closing off a rotating closure of sites so that uh, they at least give relief and don't don't have divers swimming around, et cetera. And Bonaire has probably taken the most aggressive uh, approach to this. And this is their skittled status as of October. You can see, you know, red, yellow, uh, green. Uh, and what they've done above and beyond that is they now have a protocol where the operators, uh, and they're asking the people who are, are uh, uh, diving from shore as well, uh, not to dive an infected site before you go to an uninfected site, obviously in order not to uh, uh, spread the disease. And in fact, they've uh, closed off the entire north portion of the island, which has some of the best reefs, uh, uh, entirely to any diving activity. So as I said, this is a waterborne pathogen. And of course, there are many things that could be spreading it. We, we believe that... Uh, uh, Builds, uh, builds water from, uh, from ships is really one of the main vectors. But of course, divers have to also take responsibility. And what they've done in Bonaire, you'll see here as far as equipment decontamination is concerned. I'm a biologist for Kinapa. Bonaire is currently dealing with a disease outbreak that has the potential to change the way our reefs look forever. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to decontaminate your gear in order to help us protect the reef better. Today, I'm going to show you how to clean and decontaminate your gear after a dive. Depending on what kind of gear you will be rinsing, you might need one of these three solutions. So first we have a 10% bleach solution, 
Then we have a 7% Lysol or any kind of ammonium chloride solution. And lastly, a solution containing antimicrobial soap. Before we can decontaminate our beer, we need to make sure it's clean. This means making sure there's no sediment or any other type of materials you could have brought with you from the water. While bleach is very effective at killing harmful bacteria and viruses, it can also be harmful to your equipment. This means that only non-sensitive gear should go in the bleach solution. This includes weight belts, slates, or anything else that comes into contact with the reef. So for instance, my dive reel would go in a bleach solution. My dive knife can also go in a bleach solution. It is very important to let the gear sit in the bleach solution for at least 10 minutes before rinsing it with ample fresh water. Because bleach can be very corrosive to metals and nioprene, it is very important that you don't rinse your regulator or your wetsuit in the bleach solution. For these, we use the Lysol solution. This means anything containing rubber, nioprene, or metal will go in the Lysol bucket. This includes your mask, your wetsuit, your regulator, your fins, and your BPD. After soaking your sensitive materials in the ammonium solution, Rinse them in a freshwater bucket for at least 10 minutes. Lastly, we have our antimicrobial soap solution. Any gear that is extra sensitive can be rinsed in this bucket. So this includes your dive computers, but also your cameras. So anything that goes into a decontaminating solution needs to be rinsed with fresh water. Once everything is rinsed properly, you can hang on to dry. It is important that you rinse and decontaminate your gear at the end of each dive day. Additionally, you want to plan your dives so that you are not diving from an infected site first and then going to an uninfected site. In order to help you, we've come up with a map. If you want to do multiple dives in a day, and these are in different colored zones, start with a green zone. You can then do an orange zone and finish your day in a red zone. However, we strongly urge you to avoid the contaminated zones, follow the disinfection protocol in order to help us better protect the reef. To all of our Bonaire Marine Park users, thank you so much for cooperating with us. Together, we can give Bonaire's reefs a fighting chance. If you paid attention to the map, you noticed that uh, just in the few months between that video and what I just showed you, the uh, increase in the number of contaminated sites. So uh, stay tuned. Let's talk a little bit about uh, ex a, uh, invasive species. But before we do that, I'm going to explain some dis some di uh, distinctions in, in ecology. We distinguish between an exotic species and an invasive species. An exotic species basically is one that doesn't belong there, but doesn't seem to be doing any harm or disappears. There are many, by the way, uh, Pacific fishes that have been found in the Caribbean, uh, but none have become established except for the lionfish. Uh, so those other species are uh, exotic species. Another example that uh, is often overlooked is uh, a very common coral that we find on shipwrecks and other artificial structures uh, is uh, orange cup coral, Tubastria cocinea. Uh, this is actually a Pacific coral. Uh, it was first identified in the Caribbean back in the 1940s, so it's been here for quite a while. It's also an interesting uh, critter because uh, it does not have zooxanthellae, and therefore it cannot manufacture its own food, and hence it has really, really long tentacles, so it can capture its only food source, which is in the, in the water column, plankton, etc., so just an example of, of an exotic species we see all the time. Invasive species are those that are having a detrimental effect. And of course, the lionfish, as we've talked about a few months ago, uh, certainly fits that category. Uh, well, they've been in the Caribbean for some time. There, there was a, a not completely documented sighting as far back as the 1980s. But certainly by the 1990s, they were being seen uh, in Florida and, uh, and in the Bahamas. And of course, they're, they're ubiquitous in the entire Western Caribbean now. Uh, I'm not going to get into details, but we've had enough, uh, enough uh, experience for there to be a consensus now on how what to do to keep them under control. We will not 
eliminate them. It's a, it will be impossible due to their reproductive biology to really eliminate them. But they are controlled in areas where there is consistent culling efforts. And what you see here is kind of an infographic from a paper uh, that was uh, done last year. And in green, you see all of the strategies that they suggest for uh, the uh, for the purpose of controlling them. Uh, and there are things we're aware of now that uh, encouraging a market to sell them because they're delicious, of course, uh, promote uh, act, you know, hunting uh, the derbies and other hunting activities, allow anyone to hunt them. As in Florida, there's no license required. There's no seasonality. You can go kill them at your leisure. Uh, encourage tournaments, of course, make it competitive. Uh, involve uh, lots of lots of partners in uh, the management process and coordinate the management as is frankly well done in the Caribbean. The two things that su it suggests you not do is a bounty programs which were tried early on uh, and all that happens is that money's exhausted and you know the, the problem continues. And the other thing is not to feed them to predators. And it was, and in some places, still popular to feed the fish on the spear to a shark or a moray eel. Uh, that has been problematic, and, and I'll show you why. So by habituating these predators, and by the way, I have a video similar of a, of a green moray eel, uh, they, have, they have come to expect and to associate the fishers when they hear that sound of the fish being shot uh, to come. And in fact, there have been some locations where they've have to, they had to stop calling efforts uh, for a, a protracted period of time simply because the, the, the fishers could not safely uh, you know, harvest them. So don't feed them the sharks, it's duh. Uh, there are also, as I mentioned uh, last, last time, there's also a problem with what we call spatial competitors. Now, if you did uh, attend back in uh, November, uh, or October rather, uh, I talked a little bit about, about this uh, critter called Palithoa curbiorum, people mistaken it for a coral. It's not, it's a... It's a zo zoanthid is basically a colonial sea anemone, for all, lack of a better term. And what happens is as corals die off, the space that's available is taken up by these critters that can reproduce and grow much more quickly. And so space that would otherwise be available for coral larva to settle and, and for new coral to grow is already occupied and therefore it can't happen. Uh, but as I said, these are uh, these are uh, you know the the species name Caribiorum. These are not uh, invasive. But what I want to bring your attention to is what's happening in the southern Caribbean is a an invader, a soft coral species, uh, Uniomia uh, stellaniferifera. And uh, here's a quick video of what it looks like. Now, right now, this is only a problem apparently in the extremely southern Caribbean reefs in uh, uh, Venezuela and uh, and uh, and I believe uh, Brazil, but that's awfully close, you know, to other regions. To my knowledge, has not yet been reported in areas like uh, Bonaire or Curaçao, but as you can see, this admonition from uh, <laughs> Dr. Ignacio uh, Agudo. Uh, they're very, very concerned, and uh, I'm sure there you may be seeing some uh, uh, this crop up as time progresses. Now, to show you sometimes the difficulty, this is not Unioma. This is a uh, species of Caribbean soft encrusting soft coral called Erythropodium. And so to the uninitiated eye, they look very similar. So this is one of the problems we have, and as I'll show you another example here, in really having the, the, the insight and the training to identify 
you know, these, uh, these critters. More to the point, there is another uh, problem. This is not invasive, uh, but if you uh, tuned in last time or previously this year, I talked about the importance of CCA, Brustos carlin algae. This is an important member of the reef community because it helps to bind the reef together. And the, uh, the microbes that, that populate the surface send out signals to the coral larva to say, hey, come settle here. So this is an important contributor to reef health. But if you look on the uh, <laughs> left here, these yellow crustaceans, these are packs or pycinid algal crusts. And it turns out they're just the opposite. They're sending out signals that, that actually uh, prevent coral settlement. And in fact, this has been a considerable problem, mainly in the Virgin Islands. Uh, this has not yet been reported to my knowledge extensively otherwise, but these are the kinds of issues that essentially we, we need to be aware of. And so I think it comes down to the need to, you know, continue just to, you know, stay uh, educated and aware of what the problems are and do all you can to, to help out. I promise, as I said, we're not going to close on a totally uh, down note. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, article from uh, the Curacao Chronicle. Uh, it looks like uh, the reefs down there are, you know, beginning to uh, show signs of recovery. You know, there's likely to be some mortality, certainly, but it doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, devastating. And then uh, globally, this came out from the Wildlife Conservation Society. This was a little news release. And there are instances globally where reefs you know, uh, seem to be doing well and actually either recovering or not even being affected by bleaching. So this isn't a, a total gloom and a doom and gloom uh, idea. Uh, if you were with us before, you probably saw this graphic, but I thought I, it was worthwhile, you know, uh, reiterating things that you can do that are pretty simple. Be responsible with regard to your, your consumption. If you're a fisher and you're gardening, don't use fertilizers any more than necessary, particularly. Uh, support the establishment of marine protected areas, particularly the, uh, the 30 by 30 initiative. The, the idea is to set aside 30% of the ocean as a fully as fully protected in order for that it to recover and to replenish the other 70%. Uh, when you make choices to uh, to go diving, to support operators that are uh, doing the right thing, and, and you, can, you can count on the uh, the travel department and dive ventures to make sure that in the, indeed is the case. Uh, one interesting recent uh, finding was the three most significant sources of CO2 currently, China and India. And the third source is not a country, it is international aviation. And so what that means as tourists, we, we have an obligation to do what we can. And fortunately, there are ways we can do our part with regard to car carbon offsets. And the website there from the Ocean Foundation is one of the calculators where you can determine how much carbon you're going to put into the atmosphere via a trip of some distance and how much money in a donation to a carbon capture program, especially blue carbon, uh, mangroves and seagrass bed res restoration uh, is, uh, is worthy. For example, when I went to the Philippines this past summer, I calculated that about it was about uh, twenty. Uh, I forget what the what the contribution was, but it basically was offset with a contribution of less than ten dollars. Uh, responsible seafood consumption, of course, their guidelines provided by uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and importantly, don't just keep this information to yourself. Inform other people. Advocate vote for people who are who are committed to doing the right thing because uh, Bill Nye just recently had an interview 
And they asked him, what are the two things you can do most? And he said, it's not recycling. He said, A, talk about it. And B, vote for people who will make that the changes as appropriate. And then lastly, you know, try to do your, your own part by keeping your carbon footprint down to what it is. And so that's pretty much what I want to talk about as far as the year end uh, news. I think those are the most significant things that have been happening, certainly in our neck of the woods in the, in the Western Caribbean. So we will turn attention now to uh, uh, something near and dear to me because I live here. And that is Florida. Uh, what you see there is a very robust uh, itinerary of trips that are, <clears throat> uh, these are bus trips that run out of our, uh, our Atlanta locations. And if you look through them, there are three locations that are highlighted. And the X's on the map show you the, the northern X there, that's cave country. And then the middle X, that is Jupiter. And then, of course, the lower X there is the Florida Keys. And you kind of see what the destinations are. I will bring to your attention uh, two issues, one of which the, uh, the deep diving, uh, uh, the Jupiter uh, uh, excursions, because of the, not only the depth, but also the challenge, uh, a advanced certification or extensive experiences probably suggested there. And then likewise with the, the wreck trip as well. So what I thought I would do is kind of look at each of the three locations briefly and, and give you some insights that, you know, often aren't really discussed. And so let's talk a little bit about cave country. These are two of the most popular uh, and best, uh, most easily accessible uh, destinations, uh, Blue Grotto and, uh, and Devil's Den and, uh, Blue Grotto particularly is kind of famous. My my, my friend Harry Averill uh, does the marketing and social media there. And he's produced this uh, little video of Virgil. And you'll be seeing Virgil here in a second. Virgil is a Florida soft-shelled turtle. And uh, she was not born there. She got too big for her uh, aquarium and was donated. Now, she was hatched in 1957. Uh, and because she did not grow up in the wild. She's not really aware of, or not really afraid of people. Uh, she was named Virgil before they realized she was a, a, a female. So uh, Miss Virgil. So it's, the, it's, she's kind of the creature feature for, uh, for Blue Grotto. Uh, uh, Devil's Den, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't have quite that, doesn't have a personality like that, but it's a very interesting uh, location. But what about these, caves and caverns. What's this all about? How in the world did they come about? And what people don't realize is these uh, came about for the same reason many uh, terrestrial caves came about, and that's the variation in sea level over the course of, of millennia. Uh, so for example, if you were to come to Florida 120,000 years ago, you better bring your water wings because the sea level was 30 feet higher in fact, this is the time when the upper keys, Key Largo, Isla Mirada, et cetera, they were coral reefs. And over the course of time since, with the waxing and waning of, uh, of the ice ages uh, and sea level began to drop, the water interacting with the land. Now, Florida is basically a limestone shelf. And when you add add water to limestone, you'll create carbonic acid and it'll begin to dissolve. And that's what's happened over the course of millennia. When the as the sea level dropped, all of this dissolution occurred, creating what in some places are ter are, are terrestrial caverns, but the sea level and the freshwater lens in our state, uh, many of these are still underwater. And in fact, while there are bigger cave systems in the United States, there is no more extensive uh, 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 underwater cavern system uh, in the United States. I think only uh, the Yucatan has a, a more extensive, what's called karst environment. And so these are the results basically of 
constant the constancy of sea level change. And you can kind of see here what what Florida looked like 120,000 years ago versus uh, 18,000. Now, again, if you came here 18,000 years ago, uh, you better have your walking shoes because our coastlines were about 200 miles further offshore because the the water level was 400 feet lower. And so that constant waxing and waning provided the uh, uh, process by which these caves and caverns were uh, created. Uh, the diving off of Jupiter uh, is, of course, uh, centered around sharks because shark diving has been so popular there for uh, several decades now. I do want to emphasize these are not caged, uh, these are not fed dives. So you're not going to be going out there with food, but many operators do. And over the course of time, especially lemons, silk, silkies, and bulls uh, are quite prevalent, although uh, it's not unheard of to see uh, a couple species of hammerheads. Uh, and there, was, there are even a couple of videos out there with uh, spearfishers who've encountered great whites, that I, I believe it or not. So this is really shark country for Florida. And uh, uh, I would really encourage you to participate. Do be aware, because the Gulf Stream comes closer to the U.S. here than anywhere else, this is drift diving. It is drift diving, and it's often in deeper water than you might uh, assume. So you need to have uh, you need to have a good comfort level in the water, ideally with uh, advanced certification or, or under some good supervision. This is not for a, a newbie, basically. But newbies have ample opportunity to enjoy the Florida Keys. Uh, what you see here, of course, is a map of the sanctuary outlined in red. It is, it, it's as big as the state of Delaware, by the way. Uh, it encompasses all the areas underwater. And in particular, these pointed out are the sanctuary preservation areas. These are the 28 no-take zones, which comprise 85% of all scuba diving. Uh, by the way, what we, that uh, unfortunate video we saw with all the bleaching, that's Chica Rocks. Uh, but most of your diving will be in the upper keys, which frankly has, in my view, the, the best diving anyway. Uh, and uh, this is quite appropriate for any level of diving. It would be uh, unlikely, except in the wreck excursions, that you dive deeper more than 30 or 35 feet. And uh, uh, it's quite it's a really good orientation to, uh, to uh, uh, ocean diving. But do be aware that for the, the wreck trips that uh, the sanctuary and actually the state of Florida really promote this idea of the, the shipwreck trail. This is from Noah's website, by the way. And uh, sites as the, as the Duane, the Bibb, uh, the Benwood, the city of Washington. And uh, although it's not on there, the, uh, the uh, Spiegel Grove are, uh, are wonderful wrecks uh, that I would encourage anyone with the appropriate experience uh, to dive. Uh, and so that's pretty much brings me to uh, my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I do want to just bring out one thing. Uh, many of you in the audience, I assume, are dive professionals. And uh, unrelated to dive ventures, uh, I am going to be presenting another webinar uh, next week, actually, uh, called How the Dive Industry Must Adapt to the 21st Century. This is a request that was made of me. This is a seminar I did at DEMA. And, of course, many people were un unable to attend. Uh, so if you're interested, just drop me a note if you can't copy that URL, and I'll, I'll send you a, uh, an invite uh, for that. And it will be recorded as well if you can't make it. So then in closing, you know, if you have questions, as always, I'm as close as an email. And if you have specific questions about the, the Florida trip, uh, contact Claude Smith. Uh, he and I had some really good discussions, and it's... Uh, I think it would be a really wonderful opportunity, those of you who can, to, uh, to jump on one of those trips. And I may see you in January if you're, if you're down here as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn control back over to uh, Jessica and open it up for questions, either in the uh, uh, chat or if you want to open your mic, uh, that, that as well. Yes, absolutely. Feel free to drop any questions in the chat or yes, yeah, speak up if you have them here 
Um, but a huge thank you to you, Alex, for hosting this webinar and some really important questions. Um, and we're gonna keep being here and doing all we can to make sure that Generation Alpha or that the coral reefs far outlive Generation Alpha and, and doing all we can to bring some optimism to that. But some really important um, pieces and events happening this year and of course in many years prior. So appreciate the education that you're sharing um, with us and just encourage everyone, as Alex said, to educate those that you know and, and talk about this and all that we can be doing to help keep our oceans healthy and thriving. I want my Miss Maggie to see coral reefs, please. <laughs> yes, do it for Maggie. Hi, Linda. I would, hi, I would like to ask a question, Mr. Alex. Um, a friend of mine, Kim Glesner, has helped with uh, some mm -hmm. of the projects that you do down there in Key West. And she was talking about harvesting the, uh, the spores from the different coral and that type of thing. So I was curious about that video that you showed a link to of pulling up some of the babies that you all have planted and how has this bleaching, this temperature affected what you have done as far as hosting some, uh, harvesting some of the spores? Thank you for everything you do. You're amazing, dude. Thank you. First of all, Kim is a former student, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that she's stilling to do uh, 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 two things here. Let's talk about the, the actually the, the, the uh, eggs and sperm. Uh, if you, if you were in the, webinar on uh, coral reefs that I did previously, or if not, go to the uh, the video. We talked, we showed how what's happening in the field is there is, there is transplantation of live adults, basically fragging them and growing them out and replanting them. Uh, and that's a hugely labor intensive and limiting in terms of, of, uh, of scale. Uh, what is also happening, which has more potential is capturing the gametes, the eggs and the sperm, after they, you know, they lay eggs essentially, and then uh, raising them to a ensure that there's complete fertilization of all the eggs, and then allowing those eggs to hatch in captivity in special uh, enclosures, and then allowing them to settle on uh, concrete star-like structures that they then transplant into the reef. So basically you're assisting the corals in their sexual reproduction in addition to the fragging. So these are kind of two uh, approaches to to deal with. What's happened, my, again, I've, I've not been as involved in this as I have been in the past, but it appears that there has been a lot of mortality. Uh, however, uh, many of the corals that they they put in deeper water nurseries uh, are now being brought back to shallower uh, 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 shallower depths because the temperatures have dropped. So there's been good survival. The other thing they did is many of these uh, frags they took out of the ocean and they put into various aquaria and marine uh, labs throughout the state and actually the country. There's there's some in Chicago, in uh, Chicago and in Ohio. And they're going to be held pretty much as kind of a Noah's Ark uh, so that no matter what happens in terms of the, the ocean and, the, and the, the, the future of coral reefs, these genotypes will be saved you know, for posterity. Uh, so I guess the answer to your question is uh, the, the bleaching event is still so recent that it, uh, uh, we don't know the results. It hasn't been utterly disastrous. To what degree it's affected uh, the the uh, the uh, spawning, I don't think has yet been uh, been established as well. But uh, rest assured, the folks that are doing this are still charging hard, and they've not been discouraged. And uh, I would encourage you, if you do come to the Keys, try to get involved with, with in one of the many programs that use uh, recreational divers as volunteers to help maintain the nursery and in, in some cases help do the, tra the transplantation. There are lots of opportunities. Send me an email and I'll be happy to give you details. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And thanks for everyone for spending some time with us this afternoon. Happy holidays to all of you. Okay. And again, I, I, I'm very sincere in the, in, in please uh, don't hesitate to drop me a note. Thanks again. That would be awesome.
Thanks, Alex. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.